Hello again, this is Ray Farrow. It's been my ongoing pleasure to bring Sunday School lessons to you. Uh, and I thank the staff of Kyokie Baptist Church, uh, especially Wes Gardner, for allowing me to do this, for Mary Dant, for uh, taping these. And uh, just to let you know, I'll finish out the lessons in the month of July, and then Wes will do the lessons in August, and that way each month we can have uh, continuity uh, by having a, a consistent teacher for the month, but, uh, and then we'll see. You know, when we get back to Sunday service, Sunday school services, and it, you know, we're praying sooner than later. But I really do thank uh, our staff and thank God for the foresight to provide Sunday school lessons in this way to have a, a greater reach and to say to those who are who are uh, wanting to study the Word of God, you know, there there's more than one way to get something to do, get something done. You can study this at home um, just like you would study in a Sunday school classroom and I'm glad that our church is making this available. So as we dive into Proverbs 14, 8 through 15, uh, just want to let you know as your book has already told you the structure of this particular uh, little passage this is uh, what's known as a chiasmus in that the first four verses kind of go in proving one, two, three, making four different points and then each of the verses is linked with another verse so that you go in point one, two, three, four and then the fifth point agrees with point number four it kind of elaborates on that it, uh, uh, elucidates the same theme and then these two verses will line up and then these two and then these two so it's kind of an inside and then back out again framework known as a chiasmus and um, what I just did and, and kind of the way I'll, I'll teach through this a little bit and your book has done this is I just matched up verses 8 and 15 and verses 9 and 14 10 and 13 and 11 and 12. And if you're uh, a fan of the NCAA tournament, basketball tournament, the uh, March Madness, you know how that kind of goes where you link uh, number one and number 15 seeds. Uh, the difference in this is there are no weak teams, there are no weak words or weak lines in the Word of God. So here's a, a Hebrew structure. Uh, it's known as a, a chiasmus. Uh, for teaching that Solomon employs uh, a number of times throughout Proverbs. So here we go. Uh, and again, so you're going to see some of the same uh, ideas or themes um, that have been repeated before. Again, wisdom is calling and instructing those who will listen. And uh, you might ask, why does Solomon repeat these things so often? Well, you know, teachers why do you go over and repeat the same things to your class? Parents, why can your children now recite some of the house rules by rote? Mom or dad always says this. Why? It's, it's, that's the way we instruct, by, by repetition. And soon those things burrow down into the soul, burrow down into the head and the heart, and, and come out through uh, our actions, through our hands. Sir Thomas More said it far more briefly and eloquently when he said, the world does not so much need to be informed as to be reminded. We don't need to be informed so much. We, we've got plenty of information as to be reminded of what we already know. And our lesson today reminds us that following God's wisdom leads to joy. In contrast, Failing to do so, to follow God's wisdom, leads to grief. So as we go through Proverbs 14, we'll uh, start off this way. The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way. Verse 8, the wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. And in verse 15, that thought is continued. The simple 
or naive or gullible. The simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. And what Solomon is doing here is making a, a distinction between the ways of the wise, the ways of the prudent, and the ways of the foolish. He's talking about the difference discerning versus deceit. And, uh, and one of the things I want us to see in the wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. That word there uh, for prudent can be, it's, it's the word, the Hebrew word uh, arum. Uh, it's a derivation, aram, from the Hebrew word arum, which means uh, prudence, but it also mean, can mean crafty or subtle. And uh, it's a fascinating picture. If you go back to Genesis uh, chapter 3, uh, and even at the very end of Genesis chapter 2, uh, you get the line in Genesis 3.1, Now the serpent, who we know Satan embodies and, and tricks Eve, who then deceives Adam, uh, it says the serpent was more crafty, or some translations say the serpent was more subtle than any other beast of the field. And this, this idea of prudent means Gaining knowledge, which is neutral, you know, not being gullible anymore, not being simple. As you, as you live life, you learn, you learn more and more things. And, and this, is a, a, this idea of prudence comes as a, as a neutral that can be used either for good or for evil. This idea of Hebrew word of craftiness. And so you get the picture in the very end of Genesis 2, it said, Adam and Eve were both naked and they were not ashamed. This word, arum, from which we get prudence and from which we get craftiness, uh, literally it, it, all, it means to be naked. Nakedness comes from this Hebrew word, arum, so it means they were, they were naked. There wasn't anything added on to them, if you were, if you will, um, but they knew no shame from it. And so the idea is they're naked, but in, in a simple way. They're, they, they have uh, no knowledge that there's to be shame found in this nakedness. And then it says that the, the serpent comes, and it uses this, this word again. Only it's, the idea is where Adam and Eve uh, were not um, naked with any sense of craftiness or oh, look what we're getting away with. Uh, the serpent had knowledge, uh, but he was going to use that knowledge to deceive. So the idea of prudence is you, can, you have this knowledge and this learning, and it can be either used um, in a positive way to warn others to say, I know something and I want to use it to warn you to avoid something bad and to stay toward the good. Or the serpent had knowledge, but he used it in a crafty way to deceive Adam and Eve to say, I'm going to give you knowledge that God is hiding something from you. And he tricks them. And then once they now their eyes are opened, the idea is now they have a certain craftiness. They are now naked and they recognize it, but they're no longer um, simple in their innocence. Now they have knowledge, but with it is a, a, a craftiness, a shrewdness to try and deceive God. And so when God comes and says, Adam and Eve, where are you? And he knows where they are. They said, we were naked, but now they're not in their simple innocence naked, now they have a craftiness. And so they say, and so we hid. So the idea has come full circle. They've gained knowledge, but now they've used it not for positive, but it's come around to be crafty, to try and deceive God or to hide from God. So this idea of the wisdom of the prudent you're going to have experiences in life. You're going to learn things. You're going to gain knowledge. The question that, that Solomon wants you to ask and wants you to think about as he goes through these verses is the experiences and the knowledge that you gain, the 
worldly wisdom, if you will. Is, is it, your wisdom, is it only worldly, or do you also have godly wisdom? Do you use the things you know to try to trick others, or to lead them in a bad way, or in a shrewd, crafty way that isn't positive, or knowing what you know, parents, ministers, knowing what you know, and maybe some of the folly and foibles and failures in your own life, knowing what you know about sin, do you try to entice others in a negative way, or do you use the wisdom of the prudent to warn them about falling into bad patterns, bad practices? So, the wisdom of the prudent is to discern, to skillfully plan, to, uh, to understand his way. The idea is you take the things not only that you're learning in life, but the wisdom of godly wisdom, the things that God is showing you as you go along the path, for the, the, the idea to discern his way, this is darak, the Hebrew, for a, a well-trodden, it comes from the word to, to tread down, a well-trodden path. You've got life experiences, you've been going along this path. What Psalm is saying is, are you gaining godly wisdom so that you follow and can teach others to follow a positive way, or are you using the smarts you learn in life to be shrewd and crafty and to deceive others. Solomon lays it out. The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way or discern his path, to understand his path. The folly of fools is deceiving. Well, who's deceived by the folly of fools? Well, nearly everyone. If you hang around with people who don't have godly wisdom, Who's going to ultimately be fooled, be deceived by that? Well, first of all, the foolish are themselves going to be deceived. Is there a greater deceit than self-deceit to, to go through your life and realize, you know, the real fool who got fooled was me? And then... Secondly, those who are with the foolish, those who befriend and stay with the foolish and listen to them and learn from them, they're going to be fooled. So a fool and his friends will both be deceived by folly. Who's in back of this deception, this folly? Well, in the Bible, Satan is called the deceiver over and over. He deceives nations. He deceives individuals. He tries to deceive people away from the truth of God and deceive people from coming to accept Christ. But ultimately, not only is a fool deceived by his own folly, not only are his friends deceived, but folks, Satan is actually deceived. Satan, the great deceiver, is the one most deceived by his own folly. He's a careful and shrewd planner, but he does not realize that all his plans will one day come to naught. They'll come to emptiness. And he is now has been defeated by Christ at the cross and will ultimately be defeated. So Solomon's pointing out two ways, the ways of the wise, the ways of the fool, the ways of the discerning, and the ways of the deceitful. And then he comes back around to it in verse 15 to say, The simple believes everything. Wisdom has made several calls in previous chapters. Wisdom called out to the scoffers and to the fools and to the simple to come gain wisdom. But the scoffers, when they heard wisdom's call, they mocked it and didn't want anything to do with it. The scoffers just laughed at godly wisdom. And so then wisdom called to the fools and the simple. But the fools, when they heard wisdom, they tried to deceive themselves and deceive others and would not accept 
godly wisdom. They were fools not because they saw it at the outset and didn't even want it, but the fool tried to take in wisdom and then didn't believe godly wisdom. And now finally, the last call is made. Wisdom simply says, the scoffers don't even want to hear it. The fools reject wisdom. So now I'll call to the simple. And the idea of the simple there is the naive or the, gov the, the gullible. gullible. It doesn't mean that the simple are imbeciles that they can't learn or that they won't learn. It simply means that they haven't learned yet. And so wisdom is calling and saying, as you begin your path, fill it with godly wisdom so that you don't fall into these uh, mistakes of folly. The simple, uh, without godly wisdom, the simple who are innocent, who are naive, they are victims of gullibility. But wisdom said the prudent, the one who, who thinks their steps through, who considered what a, a plan of action is going to lead to, says the prudent gives thought to his steps. The idea is there, there is planning beforehand. And so Proverbs uh, calls, wisdom calls in verses 8 and 15 for us to distinguish the two ways, the ways of wisdom and the ways of folly. And then what Solomon is going to do, after he's talked about the prudent and the fools, he's going to talk about those who make amends for sin and the results, the what's going to happen at the end, whether or not they make amends in a prudent way or in a foolish way, and what that's going to lead to. The idea is that fools mock in verse 9, fools mock at the guilt offering, but the upright enjoy acceptance. And the picture is this. And the foolish, those who, who, who follow the world's folly, are basically saying, look, sin is, is I can mock sin, I can do things and, and laugh that there's a, an ultimate authority. And, and this was even the idea of some believers who uh, would say, well, if I sin, I'll just make a guilt offering, and that'll take care of everything. Uh, in Scripture, uh, in Exodus 22.1, uh, and, and in, the, in Leviticus, offerings are made. There's a, there's a restitution offering that's made, but there's also a guilt offering made to the priest. There's a, 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 a penalty or a fine, if you will, when you committed a crime where you might give back to say, hey, I've, I've uh, committed a sin against this person. And so, for instance, uh, when David is told, uh, hey, Nathan gives him a story. Uh, in 2 Samuel 12, David is told the story of the poor man, the ewe lamb, and uh, the rich man who takes the poor man's little lamb and serves it up for a feast for his friends when he has plenty of sheep of his own. And David said, that man deserves to die, and he's got to, according to uh, Exodus 22.1, he's got to pay back four times. If you steal a sheep, you've got to pay four sheep back. The idea is you're going to make reparation, right, and you're going to make restitution, but the idea is also you're going to pay a sin offering because ultimately there is the sin you commit against somebody else, the, the trespass or the harm, the crime against somebody else, but ultimately we're accountable and responsible to God. And so we have to, we, in the Old Testament, you would make a guilt offering, you would present that to the priest not just paying back for the wrong you've done in a sense in a fine, but also saying, I'm sorry before God and I want my guilt offering to acknowledge that I shouldn't have sinned before God. And so what the scripture here is saying is the fool says, well, I'm going to do what I want. The old, you know, I'd rather ask forgiveness than permission. I'm just going to live however I want to live and, and I'll mock God by saying, Rather than trying to do the right thing at the outset, I'll do what I want. If I do something wrong, eh, I'll just throw a little in the offering plate. If you, I'll just try and buy my way out. I'll, 
I'll make this offering. And uh, what the scripture says here is fools mock at the guilt offering, but the upright enjoy acceptance. The idea uh, there and, and the complete Jewish Bible turns it this way and says, the guilt offering makes a mockery of the fools. The fool thinks, okay, I'll give this guilt offering, therefore I'll be okay with God, and it doesn't matter how I live. And what Solomon is saying, no, when you present that guilt offering without any real sense of remorse or repentance, it's the guilt offering that will mock you, O oh fool. God is not to be mocked. God is not to be fooled. And God recognizes whether the sin offering, the guilt offering, comes from an upright, repentant heart or whether it's just simply a way to get out of trouble by you know, saying, oh, I'm sorry when I'm not really sorry. And so the scripture says, fools mock or try to make a mockery of the guilt offering. But what God is saying is, no, it's the guilt offering that will mock you because I'm not going to declare you not guilty when you don't care whether or not you're really repentant. And the greatest uh, example of the seriousness of the guilt offering comes in Isaiah 53.10, where Isaiah, in speaking about Christ as our, uh, as our offering, our propitiation, the one the Messiah sacrificed on our behalf, Isaiah 53.10 says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, meaning Jesus, the Messiah. He, the Lord, has put him to grief. And then the second half says, when, when did he put him to grief? When did he crush him? When his soul, Jesus' soul, the Messiah, makes an offering for guilt. So Jesus was the guilt offering. God, in God's holiness and seriousness about guilt said, I will not accept the guilt offering of the foolish, those who mock my holiness. Rather, in order to satisfy my holiness and my sense of righteousness, God delivered up himself in the form of Jesus Christ to be the lamb, the guilt offering. Mankind's guilt offering did not come from us. Mankind's guilt offering, humanity's guilt offering was Jesus Christ. He became the guilt offering to say, God, whatever else we do to one another, the real shame and sin of all the evil in this world, the real shame and sin and hurt has been against you. And so Jesus was offered as our guilt offering. So again, Solomon is contrasting the prudent versus the fools. He's contrasting the way the fools uh, consider the guilt offering versus the, way, versus the way the upright consider the guilt offering. It says the upright enjoy acceptance. Why? Because like David, when Nathan confronted him after he had been an adulterer with Bathsheba and after he had stolen another man's wife, another uh, poor man's little ewe lamb, if you will, and took Bathsheba as, as his own and had Uriah, her husband, killed, David was, was contrite in heart when Nathan gave that report. David you know, had said of the one who did this, this man deserves to die. It's, it's fascinating that uh, there was no penalty when David said, this man deserves to die for stealing a lamb. There was no uh, penalty that said if you stole a lamb, that was a capital offense. But David being a shepherd boy and knowing how much a shepherd cares for his sheep. He spoke of this little ewe lamb uh, that the poor man raised up and, and, and had with his family. It was as though David was saying, you haven't just stolen a sheep, you've kidnapped a member of the family. That a kidnapping was a capital offense. And David, with his tender and contrite heart, that shepherd boy said, what you've done by taking this little ewe lamb, this really this deserves death, and, and David was the one who had committed the crime, but he was 
upright in heart, and, and he felt his true guilt. Solomon continues the thought in verse 14. You see how these, these thoughts run together. The backslider in heart, that's the, the faithless. And we think of those who are faithless who have no faith. Well, there are those who have never come to faith. But you also have those who have, have started down a journey and said, I have faith, but they've backslidden. They've let their heart be carried away from God where they, they started on the way of the Lord. Then they backslidden and, and they showed no ultimate faith. God, you know, they have no saving faith. Uh, not that God has been uh, unfaithful, not that God hasn't seen them through, but the seed never really took root in their heart. They said they had faith, but there was no there was no God faith in their heart to take root. It says the backslider in heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways, and a good man will be the, filled with the fruit of his ways. So the idea is the path of life that you're following, if it's filled with godly wisdom, that's going to bear fruit. And if it's filled with folly, that too is going to bear fruit. There's going to be a time at which you're going to be repaid for the way that you followed. And the backslider, uh, as we come to know in the, the next verses, uh, that way is going to be destruction. But for the upright, the fruit of his ways is not only going to be uprightness one day with God in heaven, you know, where, there, where there's only holiness and, and, and no deceit of heart, not only is he going to um, have the righteousness of Christ imputed to him, in other words, why am I an upright man? Because when God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of, of Jesus Christ in my life, Christ has covered and taken away all my sin, and God sees Jesus' righteousness imputed or grafted upon or given to or credited to me. Not only do I have that uh, given to me by God, but the idea is as the good man keeps walking this way of wisdom, that his wise decisions are going to lead to a good life. That, that, you know, not that the good man enjoys good things all the time. The upright man will never see uh, troubles or tribulations, but that the outcome of a wise decision is usually wise action with good consequences. Now, you can still do all the right things and have people try to hurt you or punish you. The idea isn't, well, if I if I do the good upright thing, if I do the wise thing, it will always come back to me in spades and there will, I'll never be punished for following the godly way. But practically, most of the time, think about it. When you take stock, take thought, take time, when you're slow to speak, slow to anger, and you think things through, don't good outcomes usually follow from that. So that's the idea. There will be a reckoning or a repayment from how we, the path that we follow. If we follow a prudent versus a foolish path, if we mock God's holiness and say, yeah, I'll just kind of live what I want and, and not worry about feeling guilty about it. And now Solomon's going to continue uh, the thought before he, before we make the turn out to, all right, we've talked about the ways that everybody can see, foolish or the wise decisions. We've talked about the things you can say or do to, to lead others, to uh, make wise thoughts, to prevent them from doing bad things, or the ways that you can deceive others. We've talked about the, the outward human-to-human -human, uh, thoughts that flow from this, but, and, and eventually what everybody's going to see how do you pay back for, for what you've done? But now, now Solomon comes in, in verse 10 to say, The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. What he's saying is, look, there are, there are aspects of our life and thoughts that nobody else 
can see is that eventually we have to come to terms and come to grips with. Um, these, these messages are, are really meant to go not just from me to you, but from God to you to say what, whatever, you know, whatever Ray says, God says, I'm, I'm speaking to you directly, my child. I'm speaking to you directly about the innermost parts of your heart, the, the things you don't share with anybody else. He say, Solomon is saying, look, there are some things, some thoughts that are, we only know in our own inner solitude. They're so deep that, that there are certain experiences that just our reaction to them is just is for us. And as much as others would try to exactly know, no one can exactly, we can all, we all have common human experiences, but there's some things that, that you just know in your deepest heart and you say, this is my thought and, and my experience alone. But the truth is, Solomon would say, and, and he, he you know, continues to say, you can, put, you can put a face on what you're feeling in your heart. Let's go to verse 13. Even in laughter, we laugh, we share a joke, but inside, have you, ever, have you ever been in a social situation where you laughed at a joke, but something was going on behind the scenes in your life where you had inner heartache, where there was something you weren't sharing with anybody else? You, you kind of had a mask on, and he says the end of joy may be grief. He says, you know, even, even in our joy, and we know this, in our Christian lives, you can have joy in your Christian life, and yet there can, you can still have days of grief, day, days of doubt, days of hurt, days of sorrow. You say, who, who else can know our heart if others can't know us the way we know ourselves in our own heart? Well, folks, God can. God can. Solomon would say, there's an individual solitude that each man and woman has, but God knows every aspect of that. And God knows your heart even better than you do. So whether today's a day of laughter or heartache, and usually most days are both, whether today is a day of grief or that unshakable, sustained joy that comes from Christ, God, like Mr. Rogers, because Mr. Rogers learned him from God, says each one of those feelings, those, those expressions of grief, of joy, of laughter, that's who God has made you. That's who you are. Don't run from what's in your heart, but turn to that and embrace it and filter the things you feel and the things you think. Filter them through the wisdom of God. God is giving you wisdom so that your joy will be unshakable regardless of the outward circumstance. God is giving you wisdom to know that even if there, there is momentary grief and, and deep grief, yet grief will not have the final word. That is the valley of the shadow of death. But that's not where we'll ultimately rest. And then Solomon finishes out by saying, now here's the end, the repayment for both the simple, that is, those to whom wisdom has been calling, but who have fallen into gullibility and naivete because they haven't sought to gain godly wisdom. And here's the end of repayment for those who have been, been wise, the prudent, those who have gained knowledge in this life and used it for good. He says, the house of the wicked will be destroyed. Now, the house can mean you and, and all your family, you know, that if you don't come under God's wisdom, that ultimately that way is destruction in hell, the destruction of your souls. Uh, the house can also mean the, the possessions, that which the wicked has ultimately you're not going to find security in your possessions, but, but all your house and all that you have is ultimately going to be destroyed. But the tent of the upright, now notice that. You think of those who are wicked, and sometimes you say, why do bad people seem to get by and get more in this life than good people? Think about a house 
versus a tent. Right? Now think of those two contrasts. But it says eventually the wicked's house will be gone. While the tent of the upright, a tent or a tabernacle was movable, the idea is, look, this earth, this life, as much as we love it, this isn't our ultimate home. We're sojourners. We're in a tent here. This body is just a tent. It's going to be replaced with, a, with an immortal body. Even if we don't have everything we want in this life, there's a life to come where the tent of the upright will flourish. So as Solomon goes to the, the, the end of, you know, the end of man, if you will, what's to happen? He says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And what Solomon is saying is, you can use smarts, education, knowledge, the counsel of others, the worldly wisdom of this culture and this age, and many people take in all this information and they plot a course, they plot a plan, they use their, their native intelligence and, they, and, and what others seem to think is right, and they, they chart their course out and everything looks good. It's not that they're choosing evil, it's just the picture is they're simply relying only on themselves and what this world has to offer for knowledge and wisdom, You're using worldly wisdom. And it says the way seems right as they start out. Maybe they're having financial success or maybe they're having relationship success. It says, but in the end, where is worldly wisdom, the, the wisdom that says, I don't need God, I don't need Jesus, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and my way is the right way. Where is that way going to end? Solomon says, the end of that way is death. Let me ask you, as we close, what ways seem right to you? What path are you following? How do you make decisions? How do you fix your calendar? How you're going to spend your time? What your life is going to lead up to? Where are you putting your money? It can seem right to you now, but ask yourself, where am I going to end up? There's a rule of one in 60. It's a rule for pilots that says you can start off knowing where your course should be and knowing exactly where you want to get to, but if you're off by one degree, by the time you've traveled 60 miles, you'll be off a whole mile. Now just think how fast planes fly and how quickly it, you can get off one mile, three miles, five miles, ten miles, twenty miles. Because the faster you go in this life, being off just a little bit each time, and boy life comes at you fast like Ferris Bueller said, the faster we go in life without checking and letting God correct our course, the more off track we can get. There's a way, and the way seems right along the way. We have others who will applaud our decisions and fools who will come alongside and say, slap us on the back and say, yeah, you're going the right way. In the end, that way is death. My brothers and sisters, take to heart what Solomon is saying. Are you prudent? Are you giving thought? Are you measuring what your way by God's way? Or are you gullible, simple, foolish, or scoffing? Like Adam and Eve, one day everybody will again, as the end of Genesis 2, be standing naked before God. That is, Everything revealed and all the things we possess gone away from us. When we stand naked before God with all that he has tried to teach us and given us, on that day, will we want to say, here I am, Dad, standing upright because I listen to you. Or will we just want to run and hide?
the way of the wise, the prudent, is the way of God's wisdom. Be blessed.